Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 229. That was the day when I was like, wait, I will make something and people will give me money for it. Attention, gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and I'm thrilled to have you joining me here today. I can't believe that the summer is almost over. The kids are back or on their way back to school, and I can definitely feel the switch. The pace is picking up. I think people are looking toward the holiday season and setting their plans in place for that. If you're just starting your business, the holiday is a great time to run some tests on your products too. If you're thinking of doing some fall or holiday craft shows, church bazaars, things like that, you can observe what sells best. Maybe it's certain sizes and colors. You can test out your pricing And you can talk with the people who come by and look at your displays, too. There's a wealth of knowledge that you can learn that will serve you in the future. So take advantage of this opportunity if you're new to business and you're checking to see what the market looks like for your product. Also, an FYI, I'm going to be at the Philadelphia Candy Show the weekend of September 7th. It's appropriately enough in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and we'll be there exhibiting for the Ribbon Print Company, and I'll also be doing a class on what's working now in social media. Gosh, this is the presentation that I have to change almost every time I present it because things keep changing there pretty much by the month. So definitely check this out if you're in the area. I'd love to meet you in person, take pictures, all those fun things. The show today is a really fun one, especially if you're just starting out because you'll hear from the start how a product found its place, was validated, and went on to become an entire business unto itself. I can't help but smile when I think of this, and without keeping you questioning what the heck I'm talking about, let's just dive right into the show. to introduce you to someone that I just met a few weeks ago. Kenneth Kudulis and his wife have created a company called Kudula. Established in 2007, Kudula is a husband and wife duo originally based in Brooklyn. Harnessing the power of awesome, Kenny and Jennifer bring you Critters, their original monster-like characters that are inspired by folks seen traveling through the New York City subways. Kenny sketches, paints, and names all the characters, and then Jennifer creates their individual bios. The critters are often seen captured in their mason jars or juxtaposed into the couple's original photography. All pieces are lovingly handmade by Kenny and Jennifer in Chattanooga, and today we have them right on the show. Welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. I'm thrilled that you're both here. We're going to have a really good talk, I just know. (laughs) (laughs) But before we get started, I always like to introduce you in a creative way, and that is by having you share, if you had an ideal candle that looked just like you, what would be a color and quote on your motivational candle? Well, mine, I love the color Midnight Blue, and I love the quote, there's nowhere to go but everywhere, so just keep on rolling under the stars, and that's from On the Road, and it's Jack Kerouac. Always like that one. Love it. There's nowhere to go but everywhere. And mine is a little bit different. Mine would be the color of Pumpkin Spice, and I particularly like the quote from Jan Barry's Peter Pan, all the world is made of faith and trust and pixie dust. I love it. You guys are like so perfect together, can I just say? (laughs) We've heard that. (laughs) And might I also just note, I'm from Chicago, so blue and orange, go Bears. (laughs) Go Bears. I just just had to put that in there. (laughs) I like the Cubbies. I grew up uh, watching WGN. My dad is from Chicago, so yeah, we watched the Chicago games. There you go, and I'm a Cubs girl too, so all right. (laughs) 
let me just share. I've got to tell you guys, Gift Biz listeners. So we have a fine art show and craft shows. We actually have a couple of shows each summer right in my hometown of Highland Park, Illinois. And it attracts artists from literally all over the world. And I ran into the Kudula booth last year, but you guys were so packed, I didn't get a chance to stop and talk with you. Plus, it was super hot that day. But luckily, two weeks ago, I got there really early on a Sunday, right when it was starting. And Kenny, you were around and actually had a little bit of time to chat with me. And the reason I'm bringing all this up is my intro doesn't do justice to what you guys present and your monster-like characters. They are so super cute, so colorful, so original. And just to explain for you guys, because I know a lot of you can't see them right now and don't have in your mind's eye what they look like, think of these cute, very bold colored, very original characters, like cartoonish type characters that you own kind of in a jar. They remind me of like old Polly Pockets or the Ninja Turtle, (laughs) like something like that. But so people gravitate to the certain characters. They start Mm -hmm. to love and own certain characters and they want to then collect art where the characters are showing up. So it's like real photography, but then the character is inside a photo somewhere. So it's kind of like you're finding them out in the world somewhere, I guess I would say. I don't know if I'm doing justice to this at all, but I wanted to explain a little bit more before we got into this story. I think the best thing for you guys to do is jump over to either the show notes or their website so you can see what these look like. Of course, don't stop now. Continue listening to the podcast. But afterwards, you just have to see how beautiful, adorable, creative. I feel like I want to be a little girl again so that I could have like five of them characters. (laughs) Maybe I'm allowed to as an adult. I don't know. We'll see. You totally are. (laughs) You're totally allowed. I'm allowed. Yes. You're allowed, Tom. I actually, it's interesting when we do encounter adults and there's this sort of a moment when they're like, oh, I wish I was a kid or I wish I had kids. And I'm like, you can still have fun. And it's interesting when I give them that permission, they're like, you know, I can. Yeah. I'm a yeah. Grown up. I can make these I choices. I can do this. <laughs> I can have a little fun in my life. And then they welcome our little characters into their home. So are you giving me permission right now to come claim a character when you guys are in town? 100%. Yeah. Yes. You should pick up. Okay. It's great. People pick their personalities. It's like their spirit critter. The first mm-hmm. one they pick up is usually the one they identify with and the one that they uh, end up getting and taking on home. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. So I'm really hoping, I know you guys are coming back to Highland Park in a few weeks. I'm really hoping I'm in town because I'm going to swing by and see you guys and pick my character. <laughs> <laughs> Let's back up. Share with me a little bit about how this all started. What are your backgrounds like? How did it originate? How did Critters come to be? So I have a background in theater. That's what moved me to New York. So I was working at the Juilliard School and coming back and forth to work, you have late night calls, right? You're there two, three o'clock in the morning coming back from work. So the the trains are like, they run crazy. So to kill time, I had my sketchbook with me because we were just doodling, doing on projects during the day. And uh, I know some of you guys have been on the subways early in the morning. There's a lot of creepy crawlers. People are just to choose or maybe not choose to live there. So this was all new to me. That's a nice way of describing it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it was culture shock, I guess, to say the least, because it was my I just moved to New York. I was only there for a couple months. So this is the way I guess. Yeah, I interpreted these people. I made them into these monster little characters that later become as critters. I call them critters. So like, yeah, I kind of took parts of their personality and made them into like a bunch of eyeballs and teeth. And they were out there exploring the subways in in New York at large. So this was just a pastime. You were just doing this for fun. Yeah. At first it was just for fun. And I didn't know when I had like 40 of them, I was like, man, I have a whole cast of these things. What am I going to do with them? And so the natural thing with me is like where I found them was in the subway. So that was the first painting I was. It was of the characters in the subway. And from there I was like, oh. These guys are just exploring New York, just like me. It's like, for the first time, it's all new. I like that aspect of it. So that's where the nexus, the beginning of all of it was, was them exploring subways, paintings on photography. Okay. And so you were still doing this just as fun. Oh, yeah. It was just as fun. I mean, it was fun for the first four or five years, even when I first started selling, because I chose not to go to grad school. And I chose just to sell on the street. I had that luxury at the beginning. You were still allowed to sell on the streets on New York. So that was, I call that my schooling because I learned a whole heck of a lot because people are very truthful on the street. (laughs) (laughs) Really? So what year would that have been like 
It would have been before 2007 because you said you established the business. And so it'd be early 2000s, I guess. Yeah. So around like 2005, I actually started drawing them. So it was 2007 because that was when I first opened my Etsy shop. And I first kind of started going out as Kadula because before then I was selling kind of other things on the street too because I didn't have full confidence in the characters yet because it's like no one's going to buy these weird characters. I mean, I don't even know what they are yet. I can't sell them because I couldn't wrap my brain around what they were yet. Okay, this is really interesting. So I have two things to talk about. Now, first off, Jennifer, are you in the picture anywhere here yet? Yeah. So at this time, when we first moved to New York, we were living together and Kenny was working as a scenic artist. I was working as an actor in and out of jobs. And so in scenic calls for him were very sporadic. And then theater gigs for me were very sporadic as well. So there was always sort of downtime in between. And any free time he had, he was at home drawing and or painting. We had a very, very tiny apartment and he used to paint in our hallway on our laundry basket. <laughs> that was my studio. That was my that first was studio. Our studio. <laughs> it was a whopping three feet wide. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh my gosh. And so when he started building up his little array of critters, yeah. were you like rethinking the relationship thinking he was crazy <laughs> or <laughs> what were you thinking at that point? No, it's really interesting because he would travel to the scenic calls. Like he said, the work calls are really, really early in the morning. So with the trains being on off hours, and at the time we were in Queens, he would have to leave the house at like 3.30 in the morning, sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning. And so he took his sketchbook by the time he came home. It was never something that I really saw. He was always painting and working on stuff, and I basically was just sort of the supportive girlfriend of like, yeah, <laughs> that looks great. Maybe less of this, maybe more of this, yes. you know, just sort of a, a springboard of something. And it wasn't until he had kind of had numerous of these characters drawn and we started pulling out sketchbooks and I was like, wait, what is this? I was like, this is, oh, these are adorable. It's like, this is really cute. I was like, what are you doing with these? And he's like, oh, that's nothing. It's just, I don't know. I don't know. Is it nothing? And then he, I was like, I think it's really good. And I think having somebody else look at it that he trusted, having just like that little push of like, yeah, explore that. Yeah, just a little like boost of confidence. And yeah. it's like, oh, maybe these are something that opens up a whole world of like, okay, well, what can I do with them? Yeah. Maybe I can do this and that, you know? And I remember the first day he went out, he went out, he sold on the street. He took like two small pieces with him. No, I took four. Oh, four. That's right. That's oh, right. man. It was on a car table, the most busted car table you can think of. <laughs> And I didn't have a way to display them. So I had basically solo cups that mm -hmm. I got from the house and I duct taped them to the top and I <laughs> used those to oh. lean the paintings on. But Sue, it was so awesome. I sold three that day. And then from that day forward, I never looked back. That was the day where I was like, wait, I will make something and people will give me money for it that I made. It blew my mind. I came home. And I was so excited. I mean, we were so, over the moon. I was like, you sold three pieces. I know. Oh my God. So awesome. <laughs> I have goosebumps over here. It was so amazing. Yeah. I mean, first off, Jennifer, that you saw the characters and are like, wait a minute, we need to talk further. Like you identified that this could be something. And Kenny, you had to be so excited when that happened. And then to get validation on the street almost immediately. Yeah. That was the great thing about the street. Like I never went to grad school, so I don't know how that development process works. But say I take something to the street, I make it that week. I take it out there. If no one bought it, I was like, okay, I got to do better because obviously this is not great. <laughs> so it taught me how to talk about my art and then try to sell it, which is a whole other animal. And yeah, what people really responded to. So that helped me navigate in a lot of things early. There's nothing like people confirming that you have a product that they want, right? Yeah. Versus pretending and thinking and guessing and then they don't. So you were confirming right from the very beginning. How did you price those first pieces? Oh, my goodness. Well, the originals, I remember they were like maybe like 50 bucks or 25 bucks. No, I think they were only like $40. Yeah, I think $40 when he sold right. the three pieces, he came home and I think the whole thing was like $85. And I was like, we made $85 today. That's amazing. I mean, we were living in New York on a very, very tight budget. So to just have that kind of happen. Yeah, I know one fella, he lived in New York. And then that morning, a lady, she was visiting from Boston. She bought one. And I guess she liked it so much and it was on her mind. She came back later that afternoon and bought another one. So that was the three that I sold. But yeah, they were around like 40 bucks and they were all original. And like, I have the one that's left. So I made four and I kept one because it was one of the first ones I made. So you still have that now? Yes. I'll never sell that. It's the first one I made. 
it is the first of the first painting I ever did. Oh, wow. You do fall in love with them. You really do. I totally see it. And when I was at the booth just a couple of weeks ago, I was seeing people coming and they were looking for new photos with their particular critter on it. So I understand what you're talking about where that woman was like, she loved the one, she came back for another. And now, I mean, repeat business is almost in your model because people are going to want to follow you and see what's new specifically with their critter. Yeah, definitely. Well, the other thing, we, we initially started exclusively doing pieces that were just on the New York City subway. And then naturally, as we started to travel and see different things, I mean, because we were very young when we moved to the city. So as we started to explore more of the world, we only felt it was natural for the critters to explore more of the world. And so now they've kind of branched out all over. And it's interesting to, to see people, they really want to see these characters in sort of their cities and cities that they know and love. Yeah, like Highland Park. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might have to figure something out with you about my whoever my critter is going to be. We'll see. Kenny, you were talking about your street sales and things that you learned right in the beginning. Do you have any tips or hints for somebody? Because one of the things that I'm really focusing on with this audience right now is to validate your idea before you spend a lot of time and money starting a business. Just like you saw so naturally that people gravitated and were purchasing. And when there's one or two sales, you know there's more. But you have to get those one or two first. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would say to somebody who keeps stopping because they weren't so sure about taping to a styrofoam cup or something, right? <laughs> like they're feeling like they have to everything perfect. What would you say to someone who's, they just need to get going and try it? What have you learned? Honestly, it's just sticking with it. And that sounds really simple, but it's very hard. I mean, you can beat yourself down and say like, oh, this is, this is awful. Uh, in your own head, this is, I don't want to show anybody this, but then you get it out there. You just got to keep grinding it. That's why we say all the time. We're just grinding. We're just, it's like Sisyphus. You got to keep pushing that rock up that hill. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> So did you have times when you brought some things out? Cause you were saying that your critters weren't the only thing that you were showing at the time, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So Jen is my, like, I bounce all the ideas of Jen. I don't know how her brain doesn't explode because I'm just <laughs> like, I throw her all ideas at all the time. Yeah. And she helps guide the ship. You know what I mean? Sometimes I get off on a tangent of creating these things and I was like, ah, yeah. And you need to stay focused up sometimes. Yeah. So. I think having somebody that you trust that also shares, not necessarily shares your taste, but can appreciate what you're trying to do. I think having somebody like a sounding board, sort of like the way that the two of us work together, he knows that if I say that something's not working or if there are elements of a piece that are really working, you know, then I will give him constructive criticism and say, this is good and this is not. I think what's really hard is that when you're a creative person and you make something and you put everything you have into it, it's very hard for you to look at your own piece that you've created objectively. And so having an outside eye come in and say, this is what's working, but this is not what's working. And if you trust them, you should be able to basically push past this little slump that you're in and make something better. The goal as artists is always to make something better, right. to always keep ourselves excited and invested in our work. But how do you get over if something like Jennifer, it sounds like you are very smooth in your feedback, right? But people who are on the street who aren't buying aren't necessarily so. Oh, no, you have to have. <laughs> you might want to edit that. I'm not sure. You can change that if you want. <laughs> no, you have to have a super thick skin if you're out there selling. I mean, even now, I mean, I've been, this is our 12th year doing this. Mm -hmm. And like when people say things, like it doesn't bother me in the least. But now you're established. But that yeah. first year, two years, yeah, it cuts. I mean, it hurts. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, it's very personal. But you just yes. have to, like, maybe go home and cry in a corner and just question your life. And then, a glass of wine. And then the next day, go out there and just do it again. I think It also, never gets easier. Say, like, year one to year 12, it never gets easier. It just changes. You know what I mean? Like, things, it's always hard. <laughs> I think that because we both came from a theater background, and particularly I came from a performance background. So at being an actor for the couple of years that I was, it's one of those things that you put yourself out there, you try 50 different auditions, you get hopefully 49 rejections. There's always that one. There's one thing. And you take that one moment and you're like, this is something that was received well. And there are so many variables that 
even when you think you know what it was and you try to recapture that, there are other things that are outside of your control. So if somebody's like, they go out and they try it two or three times, that's not going to cut it. You can't try it two or three times because what if the person that's interested in your stuff, they weren't there where you were? Like, what if they didn't see it that day? Or what if you had an off day? Or what if it was really bad weather? Or what if something happened on the news? There's things outside of your control that you have to know whatever it is that you are creating, you stand behind. Now that can change over time. I mean, and it should be able, and it It should should change. It should grow. As you grow with your product, you go out there, you're putting it out there. And if somebody has, we've heard everything. I won't repeat some of the things that you said, but you just... You say, if it's not for you, then don't buy it. Well, and that's the thing. It's okay for people not, I don't know how they couldn't, but it's okay for people not to care for what you're doing because the people who do love it. And if you play that neutral field, you're not going to attract such a loyal and solid audience ever, and you wouldn't stand for anything. So I really do think it is okay. And you don't need millions and millions of people to love what you do. To make a good living, of course, you want everybody to love what you do. I get that. But (laughs) for a solid business, you don't need that. You just need people who really take it to heart, are passionate about what you're doing, and are going to come back and are going to spread the word. Yeah, I mean, our customers are like, I love our customers. They're just like us. They're a little quirky and weird, and they like fun, whimsical things. Right. So. We, that's, I think, why we identify as, like so much with them. We're like almost instant friends with a lot of them. Yeah. We sit there and just talk. Even after they bought, they just sit there and we just talk with them because I just find them interesting too. So yeah, it's pretty great. Yeah, we actually, we've become really good friends with several of our customers over the year. Like Kenny said, they are receptive to it. And I think because we are making something that we love and when they see it, it's sort of like an added bonus. It's like, oh, well, we both like this thing. Wait, you made this thing. Oh, I like you now. I like you too. (laughs) Right. Okay. So, but let me ask you the harder question. Mm -hmm. When you were out with the street sales and you saw some things not moving, Jennifer, you're saying, well, maybe it was the third time no one liked it, but the fourth time someone would come and like it. Where is the point where you cut off, where you try and you try, you have the tough skin, you go back and cry and have a glass of wine. I'm all about that. But then- At some point, honestly, there might be some products that just don't have a market. Like, where is that line? Of course. Oh, yeah. 100%. That is absolutely. I think after like a couple weeks or something, maybe months even, you you put it out there, it always like gets to the side or it's always on the bottom right of your display. And it's like, you're not feeling that confident about it. And no one talks about it. Then I think it's time to paint over it. Or just rework it. I mean, you have to be able to, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not like we're just, it's not a passion project. You're running a business. And so you need to look at it like you're running the business. You have to look at each individual piece of inventory essentially and go, why is this piece not moving? And if you've really kind of put it in front of enough people and it's still not moving, maybe it's a pricing issue. And if it's not a pricing issue, maybe it's just time to rework the piece or to scrap it. I'll tell you, I have uh, boxes of stuff that doesn't work. So yeah, I never showed people that, but it's still there. (laughs) And also the other thing that I, Kenny and I kind of go back and forth because he is constant. He's like a machine. He's constantly creating stuff. And just because you've created it does not mean that it's ready to sell. And that's a tricky thing because especially when you're starting out, if you're starting out, I think that if you feel like your piece is ready to be shown or almost even ready to be shown, do it. Like, just do it. What's the worst that can happen? Somebody say something mean to you or they don't buy it. That's the worst that can happen. What do you mean by not ready to sell? Not ready yet. What does that mean? Because sometimes Kenny will do paintings or anything that's just not ready. You look at something, you're like, something's missing. There's an aspect of it that's just not quite right. Is Is it intuitive? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just something that once you start to look at anything, it's sort of like you're baking a cake and you decorate it and you're like, Yep, something's still missing. Mm-hmm. And when you get that that last thing on the air, you're like, okay, this is good. This is ready to present. So I think what you're also saying then is don't rush it either. You're going to know when it's ready. Don't rush making something just so that you can go sell. The product has to be right unto itself. Yeah, you have to feel like the product is ready. I mean, to get to where the characters are where they are now, it took like five or six years. I mean, it's not like a I mean, I was still selling it and still developing it, but where it actually like landed, where it was tight and awesome and was like, yes, this is it. Like it took five or six years in. So it's not a 
it's a slow process. <laughs> the other thing I keep hearing both of you talk about is that you were really focused in observing what your potential buyers were commenting on, talking about who did buy, et cetera. Can you speak a little more to that? Oh, yeah. We, we learned, especially in the beginning, a lot from the customer. Like we figured out price points, which is like an insane thing to try to figure that's, out. That's right? the hardest. It's a hard thing at the it's beginning. It's the most frustrating. Where is the pricing thing? But then like what characters they were into. Because when I first started, it was 24 characters. Mm -hmm. And then I wheeled them down to 16. And that, that's what I sell today, uh, 16 characters at a time. So I figured out how to whittle out some of the characters that weren't that strong. So yeah, just communicating with them. And people on, actually on the street too gave constructive criticism. They might not have bought, but they were like, oh, hey, I like your stand. I like how maybe you visually change this or like, it was very helpful. Like, and then as you start going out into the community, you'll find other people that are kind of in the same kind of ballpark that you are. They're sort of like, oh, I'm just starting out. And you'll become friends with those people. And then you'll also find people who've been like, yeah, I've been doing this five, 10 years. And any kind of advice that they can give you, listen to that. Yeah, that's really good advice too. You guys make such a good team. I can just hear it, but not everybody has that. Not everyone's yeah. spouse oh. <laughs> believes in necessarily what they're doing. And you do need a supporter. You were talking about that earlier, that you needed to hear from Jennifer that there was potential here. And Jennifer, you were able to talk to Kenny about, eh, not so sure about this one. You guys could support each other through a common goal of getting this out to market somehow. Yeah, and that was a very a hard thing, like just working together. But you have to be able to work together. But we also have a relationship together. So that's been a work in progress for sure. It probably always will be. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. there's definitely there are days when we have our battles. And it's like, is this a spouse battle or is this a work battle? Right. <laughs> right. But I just wanted, I also, before I forget to say this, if Gift Biz listeners, you're in a position where you don't have somebody who's supportive of you at home, what you were just saying, Jennifer, in terms of who else is at a show you're maybe exhibiting at, that is a place maybe you can find a supporter for you. You could each support each other and probably best totally separate and different products. So you're not competing for a similar purchase but you could be supporters of each other in the business. If you don't have a ready-made support system like the Kenny Jennifer team, <laughs> I guess I'll say. Oh, yeah. I mean, I learned so much about new shows or just what's a good show to go to or I tell people what are good shows just with my neighbors or like people down mm -hmm. the way. That is a crazy good, I mean, become friendly with them. I mean, we talk all the time, like maybe on text or Instagram. We keep in communication, watch each other's back about good shows, new shows. It's great that way, become super friendly with them because you learn a lot. I mean, that's how I learned about doing the road, doing all these shows all across the U.S. is from another person that was across the way out of show. So he opened my eyes to like all these other shows that were out there. I had no idea what was going on. It yeah, was amazing. You, you can find a support system out there. I mean, like you can find somebody else who is in your community that is a crafter and they definitely do not have to be doing the same thing or even in the same sort of wheelhouse as you. And actually, I find that it's better. Most of our friends, we do have friends that are artists, photographers and painters, but we also have a lot of our friends are not in those mediums. You know, they're ceramicists or jewelers or, and it's always interesting to get their kind of feedback because eventually whatever they struggle with, you will struggle with as well. And you will help guide each other through. Right. Excellent. As cheesy as that sounds, but it really is true. No, I think that's Excellent. So I was going to move on to something else, but I want to stay with the shows now for a minute. I think a lot of people think, well, shows is where I'm going to start. But you guys sound like you have continued and that is one of the strongest parts of your marketing is just being face to face with customers all the time. I would say absolutely true. I would say that's probably 85% of our business is face to face. And then the rest of it is just people that want to buy that by that day at the show, they come back on the website. Okay, so that's how they're compatible. I want to get into the Etsy site in a minute, but that's how they're compatible with each other. We're going to hear more about Kenny and Jennifer's story right after a word from our sponsor. This podcast is made possible thanks to the support of the Ribbon Print Company. Create custom ribbons right in your store or craft studio in seconds. Visit theribbonprintcompany.com for more information. How often are you guys on the road throughout the year? Oh, we have a calendar. If you could see it, <laughs> it is marked up a lot. I would say eight months. Yeah. Eight months out of the year, we're out there on the road, grinding it, doing the shows. I would say a solid eight to nine months. I mean, and of course, everyone's will have a weekend off. I think this entire, 
our season started really in like March. And from March until Christmas, I think we have basically about five to six weekends off. When I say a weekend, a Saturday, rarely get a Saturday off. It's marvelous when we do. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And now you're in Tennessee right now, right? Yes. Okay. So I saw you in Illinois. Mm -hmm. Do you guys road trip to your shows? Tell me the logistics behind all of your shows. Oh man. Like what is your life? Let's just go with that. (laughs) <laughs> That's my job. This is when people are like, oh, I wish I had a gen. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. You might get start getting offers yes. here. I like know. I needed a buddy. Yeah. yeah. So there's a, uh, of course you have to apply for your shows. And once you get accepted into your show, then you have to kind of start your roadmap. Of course we have to, because we are artwork, we have our tent, we have our walls. We have a very big, heavy setup. Jewelers, on the other hand, can pack a suitcase, rent a tent, and rent a table, and they can fly everywhere. It's really beautiful. Us, on the other hand, we have to log the road miles. And so you book your hotels, and then it's sort of like getting to the next show, and you kind of map it out. And when we started out, especially when we were doing on the road, we would go from like Texas to Illinois, and then to Florida, and then back over to Texas, which is really not efficient. And it was just very wearing on us. And so over time, you will find out what shows work for you or what markets, I should say not necessarily shows, what markets work for you. That's the most important thing. Say you're in Chicago. That's great because you're in a huge, huge market with millions of people that have so many different tastes. But then say like if you're in Memphis, Tennessee, and you really try to break out into that market, I think what's important is for you to look at your stuff and go, Maybe this is not something that's appropriate for, not appropriate, but it's not receptive in Memphis. It doesn't mean that your product is not good by any means. It means that maybe it just requires a different audience. And so being flexible to be able to travel, it does require just investing money. I think the first year that we decided to go out and start really going outside of New York, a friend of ours who's a fellow artist, he kind of took us under his wing and he was like, all right, here's the down and dirty. This is what you need to do. And we had been doing this for five or six years. Yeah, we were doing point. like street fairs in, in New York. They were just one day off street fairs. And then yeah. he was, you know, he told us like, wait, there are three or four there day shows. shows. And like, yeah. Yeah, it kind of blew my mind. And-, and so we weren't green by any means, but he was like, you know, I think that you are definitely ready to go to other places. You're ready to grow your business. Well, you grew this into a whole different level because this is now, this is both your full-time jobs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've been full-time been for, for 10 years. 10 years, yeah. And you've chosen to up the game by being on the road a lot to mm-hmm. a lot of these shows. Yeah, Yeah. And some of these shows you have to be invited to, too. You don't just get to apply and go. All of these shows are juried shows. At this point, but it wasn't in the beginning, right? No, all of them were. Um, There's always sort of like a... Not those street fairs. Yeah, the street fairs, you basically just show up. It was like 50 bucks and you show up, which was fine because we killed it there as well. I mean, your neighbor might be grilled corn and the other side will be socks. And that's a hard sell when you're selling (laughs) artwork for like, at the time it was like maybe $15. And I was like, wait... I can get an arepa or some corn or I can get socks. Why do I need artwork? I don't know what I want to do here. But it was weird for us and probably the customer. My my favorite experience, there was a woman one day selling Justin Bieber. I guess it was like the Bieber fever was like a very much a thing in that year. Mm -hmm. And there was this woman who was selling like two inch little round magnets. It was basically just a picture printed off and like slapped onto a magnet. And she was selling five for $10. And then the lady came over and she was like, oh, what do you mean? I only get one for 15? And I was like, yes. And she referenced the buttons or the magnets. And she's like, but I can get five. And I was like, well, go buy the magnets. Yeah. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I mean, but you were learning too, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm quite sure when you were doing the street fairs, you weren't envisioning where you are now. No. no. Basically, it was just survival. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So one thing advances to another. And some people might not choose this lifestyle, especially if it's not a couple team, like if it's someone who would have to leave their family. So it depends what you want for your business. But this clearly is working for you. Yeah. I think in like sort of like a very, I guess, a, a linear point, basically, Kenny made something. He bounced it off of me. I was like, this is great you should run with that. And then he created something. 
and he took it out and he had validation. This very nice lady and this gentleman, they bought. And if they hadn't bought at that moment, like on that day, I don't know actually where we would be. And we don't know who they are, whoever they are in the universe. If we could cross their paths, that'd be great. Like he had that validation. And then it was just repeat and repeat and repeat Mm -hmm. for years. And we, like Kenny was saying, we had the luxury of being able to sell on the street. But if you don't have, you know, the luxury to sell on the street, start approaching boutiques, depending on what your product is and ask them like, Hey, would you be interested in like having a couple pieces in your store or go to a farmer's market if there's a craft section or just something, there's all these sort of avenues for you to get your work seen by people. The big thing is it needs to be seen by people. Exactly. And some people are just too afraid to do that, to get out there. Woody Allen say 80% or whatever, 90% of success is just showing up. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. So true. So at what point along your path did you actually formalize the company? So register it as a real business to move forward. It was in 2007. I think it was in March of 2007. Okay. So were you able to do the street shows without being registered as a formal company? So the way it works in New York, you had to have a tax ID. And so once you have your tax ID, then you were allowed to sell in certain spots in Union Square Park and in other parks around New York. There was a big thing in around in Soho on Broadway. So like, yeah, there should be like a whole movie written about that time and those people because it was insane. It was like a free for all. Like there weren't any, now there's really stringent rules on artists setting up. You have to be in front of these little medallions. But at the time, like, you could go out there and make some insane money just by just setting up your little art gallery on wheels. Have stool will sell. <laughs> yeah, it was wild. It was, and I met some of my, still my really awesome, great friends I still have today. I was mm-hmm. met on the street because we were all going through this insane experience together, like hanging out, but selling artwork. And and to put, I guess, and for, for listeners that have not actually been to New York and have this like very weird idea of sort of what, what we're talking about, think of it as sort of like, a lemonade stand when you were a kid. <laughs> exactly, almost like That's that. basically all it is. You just take your stuff and you have like a cute little setup and you just try to sell something. And yeah, that these, was it. These are not polished setups by no. any means. No, but it sounds amazing for the sellers and the buyers alike, right? Because the camaraderie you guys probably had together because it was so casual. Mm-hmm. And then the amazing thing someone like me could walk through and discover. Sounds fabulous. There's that romance that you hear about in movies. They're like, oh, I went to Paris and then there's the artist next to the river and he's painting and I bought a charcoal sketch. And basically that's what it was. That was what was happening in New York. It was a really amazing like four or five years to be part of because those days they don't exist anymore. It's very scheduled and you know, it's very constricted. Right. But the concept behind it for those who are just starting today is the same. So you find a place to validate. First of all, you get the courage to put Mm -hmm. your art out there because intuitively you've decided it's ready to sell. Then you find the courage, you go out there, you try several times, not just once. You adjust the product if you need to, you get validation of the product and then you move forward. Yeah. You just keep doing it. It just keep repeat, wake up, think about what this thing is, make it Get it in front of somebody. Repeat. (laughs) Yeah. And then as you do this over time, your confidence will go up. You will understand who your customer is. You will understand your price points, your market, your all kinds of things. You will find out so much in the first year of business or even not even business, whatever that first from one year of the first day that you go out one year later, you will feel like a drastically different person. Well, and noted, you didn't know everything right from the beginning. You figured oh, no, it out no, as you went no. along. No, I knew zero. I started at baseline <laughs> zero. <laughs> you also, what I was saying earlier was that when we first got that sort of like that big push to be like, hey, one up, like go take this to the next level. I mean, within two months, we bought a really crappy minivan, a used minivan. We bought a van, we bought a tent, mm-hmm. we bought panels. We basically just dropped every single penny that we could scrounge up. We just went for it. And we were like, well, I hope this works out. (laughs) Faith. You had the faith for sure. Tell me the story behind the name. I mean, obviously it comes from your last name, but how did that get figured out? Yeah, it's a... Part of my last name, Kadulis, and my dad calls me Dula. I have no idea why. 
but he just called me doula. It's not having to ding to do with no. what an actually a doula is. It was your little nickname, right? Yeah, it's a little like pet name that my dad gave me. So I just put the two together, Kadula. And it's just like a nonsensical, fun word. And these characters are half things, like half cat, half like fox. They're bits and pieces pushed together too. So and it's they're fun and weird and name is fun and weird. So I was like, all right, stick to it. It goes together perfectly. So it, that was not a hard part for you, apparently, to figure out the name. No, I remember I was on a job and I was talking to this guy and I was like, I don't think my name is going to cut it with these characters. Kenneth Cadoulis, it doesn't fit this thing. I mean, I know the artist can have their name attached to it, but just to create like for branding or something, I thought it would come up with a weird word and I just came up with that. It's perfect. Absolutely <laughs> perfect. <laughs> okay. I just want to touch a little bit on Etsy and how you got that started. And we talked for a second about how you merge the two together in terms of the shows and then having people follow up on your Etsy site. But you started Etsy in 2007, because that's really your marker in time of when you pretty much say that you firmly established the business. Yeah, I would say when that Etsy shop went live, I may have went like been going out, but maybe like a week or two before that, because it was basically no, when the, it was a couple months. It was a couple, couple months, months. yeah. Okay. And then I think after a couple months, he was just like, "I'm ready to do it. Let's just do it." Yeah. Okay, but so your immediate thought was, we need an online presence as well. Yeah, for sure. Like because uh, Etsy had just, I mean, it was like the beginning days of Etsy. Those were the great days of Etsy, right? <laughs> yeah, they were like, I remember friends were like, Etsy, what's that? And it was like, you could buy something someone made in like Idaho and they'll ship it to you. And I was like, what? That sounds awesome. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I had like maybe 10 items on there at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I remember one time, and then I would keep making more and more, but one guy bought like 12 things one time. And I was like, wait, this guy bought 12 things? Like, that's insane. That's like, I didn't have to go out and sell that. That just happened and I was eating dinner. I love this idea. <laughs> and you didn't limit him. You didn't call and say, no, you can only have six. <laughs> no, no. I was like, please buy more. Buy more. Buy more. <laughs> yeah. You, you have to have an online presence, especially in today's, like, today's world. I think for me personally, as a shopper, I rarely ever buy anything like right then and there. I like to go home. I like to kind of like think about it. And it's like, do I still want this? And then I'll go online and I'll get it. But, you know, repeat customers, if you're not in the same place as your customer, you should be able to offer them the ability to purchase. Yeah. I also think when you're at shows, the squirrel syndrome, right? Like maybe someone's at your booth talking to you and then all of a sudden a friend comes and pulls them away and they're like, wait, 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 where they yeah. were looking yeah. at buying and yeah. didn't get a chance to, but they grabbed your card as they were being pulled away or child needs something or whatever it is. Oh yeah. That happens a fair amount. Yes. Does it? Oh, yeah. So much. <laughs> what does your online presence look like today? Are you still with Etsy? We have Etsy, but it's very bare bones at this day. Now we have a full-fledged website that we try to direct everything to. I still like Etsy and like the idea of Etsy, but like, yeah, it's only bare bones. It's, you can only find our jars on there. You can find the whole rest of our work only on like the website. On the website that you own. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Through okay. Shopify. Like, okay. Yeah. It's a Shopify site. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Love that. Okay. Yeah. Because the thing is, is that with Etsy, and I don't know if it's like this anymore, but when we were growing our online presence, we were like, I really want an address, a web address that is just our business name. I didn't want www.etsy.com slash Kadula. Like I really wanted it just to be Kadula.com. And also Etsy used to be, and maybe it still is, membership only. So you had to log in through it. And then in that case, a customer might get distracted by something that's sort of on a sidebar or somewhere else, or it's like, oh, I was looking at this and now I'm in a totally different mm -hmm. artist section of Etsy. And so for us, having the website specifically keeps people really focused on our shop at that moment. But at the beginning, I think having Etsy was great because at oh, the time yeah. it was like 20 cents or 25 cents to put something up. I mean, for like a couple of dollars, you could have all your work for everyone to see. That at the beginning was definitely nice because it was cheap. Yeah, yeah it's easy to put it up too. Yeah, it's easy mm -hmm. to put it up. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a great starter platform, even to this day. But you're really smart. There's a couple of things that Etsy leaves you vulnerable with. Number one, you're not able to attract email addresses. So if you ever want to talk to people who have purchased, how are you going to do that? Like you're not able to send them any information or anything when they make a sale on Etsy. 
The other thing is, what if they change their rules? I know Etsy's gone through a lot of transformation since 2007. What if they were to shut down? This is the same issue that there is with a Facebook page. If you're relying on selling through a Facebook page, if they decide to shut down, you're out of luck. With your own website, Shopify specifically, I have one of my businesses on Shopify as well and love them. You're in complete control, right, of how it looks, Jennifer, to your point, you know, yeah. what the pages look like and all of that. Plus, you own it all. You've got the information from your customer, like everything. So I love that you say that because it's a perfect example for our listeners. I will also say just in terms of diligence, in case anything crashes, you really should just export all of your contacts. Just make it a point to do, like when you do your taxes, like every year, all your contacts that you have stored in these sort of online entities, just create like an export, like PDF or, or whatever, just something to where you have them and print it off and have it on paper, just somewhere in case something happens, you don't lose everything. Yeah, just in case. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Very, very good point. Wonderful. Okay, we're going to need to start winding down here, but... I want to hear about some type of a challenging moment for you guys and then what you did to overcome some big obstacle that you had within the business. Whatever you're willing to share. <laughs> Is this like, which one? There's a million of them? Yeah. <laughs> there are so many. I mean, it's a very scary I guess at thing. what point? Like right at the beginning, the middle, where we are now? Let's see. Let me pick something. Let's do at the beginning, because I think that's where so many people, they're just afraid to jump off into the waters. Leaving my job. Ooh, good. Go with it. Kenny essentially had been going out for a solid year and a half at this point and was selling at shows and on the street and various different places. And he got to a point where he was like, I really think that I would like you to help me run the business. And I was like, you want me to help you with your business? And he's like, no, I want you to run the business. I want you to quit your job. And after about five to six minutes of like riotous laughter, I was like, because <laughs> my job pays our bills in January and February when there's no going outside in New York because it's nothing but snow. Yes. So it's a nerve wracking idea of just stopping your job, having that security blanket taken away and just doing it. It's sort of like it's ripping off a Band-Aid. If you just do it, and you really commit to it, it's over, it's done. And you'll know if it doesn't go well, or you will succeed. And most times, and from that moment on, that we've always taken that approach. We just literally jump. We just do it. And sometimes it doesn't work. We're still alive and well. It's not the end of the world. But most times, if you really fully commit to something, it will work out. So Kenny, were you feeling like there was no way to grow this any further unless you had help? Yeah, because where I was, my idea was I could be selling at this part in Union Square and she could go out in another place and we could have two booths and almost double down on sales. That's what I was thinking. Like how amazing it would be to like, if one of us has an okay day and one of us has a great day, but that's still good. Or if one of us has a really bad day, then the other person might have a good day. Yeah, so I was just trying to do two spots, just trying to, I guess, double dip. And um, I couldn't do that. And I couldn't logistically like start making the items that I was doing. Right, because the more you sell, the more work you've just created for yourself. Yeah. You more. <laughs> yeah, the more yes. you have to make. Yeah, and so is that how you guys started, just double exposure then? Yeah, because at the end of the day, the more people that see your work, whatever you make, the more chance of somebody buying it. Mm -hmm. It's all about exposure. There's, of course, there's online, but in person, really, that kind of takes the cake for everything because they are not only buying a piece of artwork from you, like they're buying a piece of you. Like yeah. you are speaking to them. And they, so they many remember times, the that's, experience. Yeah. The experience in that moment, it is a lot to that object. Like yeah. when they take it home, they're taking home that experience and that object. It's crazy because they tell our story yeah. to friends and then people will come up and they're like, oh my gosh, my friends bought these and they're adorable. And then they're like, how is your dog? And I'm like, oh my God, you know my whole story. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. Well, yes, they've fallen in love with you and they're buying now because it's you too. You're an overlay on top of all of it for sure. I know that you guys have divvied up the experience in, in terms of the creative and then the history behind each character. You've divided that. Do you each then have responsibilities throughout the whole business? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so actually, the characters did not have any kind of stories until I started working with Kenny. Because I had not created the piece itself, being just a salesperson, I was like, I don't really know how to speak to customers. I don't really know how, like, I'm not invested in this. Because at that time, Kenny was just, he was making this. This was his project. And so in order for me to kind of personalize it and take ownership of it in a way that I could feel confident to sell it to somebody, I just kind of started making up stories. I mean, the characters to me, because I never saw the individuals that they were drawn after, they were always very adorable and precocious and they had these huge personalities. And when I talked to customers, I would just kind of like tell them stories about these characters. And it only became problematic, but in a very good way in the end, when people would come to Kenny and they're like, oh, so which ones are dating? And he's like, oh, no, you talk to Jen. <laughs> like, I don't know. He's like, <laughs> right. <laughs> She's got all the scoop on the characters. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That and was like totally her idea, her brainchild, which is brilliant because it allows people to connect with them on a more personal level. Like they get into the personality of the character and. Yeah, it just, it fully formed them. It completed them as a whole little guy, little critter. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. They're like our little kids. Yeah, like our little kids. We, I love all of them. I do play favorites, even though I guess you're not supposed to as a parent, but <laughs> that's what I've been told. But I have favorites, you know, but I do love them all equally. That's so adorable. I love that. Okay, so everybody, you guys have to go and look at all these characters. What I'd like to do at this point, because... You have given us such great information. I have so enjoyed listening to all of this, learning more. I intentionally told you guys I didn't want to know the whole story because I wanted to know and hear it just as all of our listeners are hearing it. But now in return, I'd like to offer you a virtual gift. It's not a critter, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future, for what's next. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you'd wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What's inside your box? Sue, you're so very generous to give us two tickets to the Academy Awards where we were nominated for Best Animated Short and we won. Hello! <laughs> I love it, love it. Wait, are you saying that there's video in the future here? Yes, that is our long-term goal. We have yeah. some awesome short ideas. And I think one is like heartbreakingly amazing. We're just, I think we're just waiting for that time to work with the right person to make it happen, you know? Like around the critters, like bringing them to life? Yeah. 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 Well, what do you mean? They are alive, right? They are alive. <laughs> like, I mean, on the screen. That's yeah. what I mean. And a little animated short, about five, seven minutes. Like, uh, yeah, so I would yeah, love to we, see the move. We have short ideas and, I mean, we have stories, working on storyboards, but it's a matter of collaborating with the right person to pitch these things to, because like I said, these are, they mean the world to us. They're essentially like our little kids and they live with us. They travel with us everywhere. They're very much entwined in our life and giving somebody permission to have them and work with them. Kind of nerve wracking. It's like taking your kids to school for the first time. I understand that. I get that. But I so see that. I really do. I know. It'd be awesome. It'd be totally awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm cheering you on already. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Kenny and Jennifer, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I knew I was excited about having you guys on the show. I had no idea it was going to be so great. Thank you so much. I love that you've been here. And I look forward to seeing you guys when you're back in my hometown again in a couple of weeks. Yay. Awesome. Thanks, Sue. What an amazing story. Going from just a pastime of doodling on the subway to creating an entire business of critters with personality and life. I can't help but smile. You really, really have to go and see these cute, adorable critters. Up next week, we'll be hearing from another business owner who has found the key to getting big business from large corporate accounts. And with the holiday coming, big businesses have big budgets to spend on gifts, and you may find just the thing to capture your rightful portion of this market. That's next Monday, but for now, it's a wrap. After you listen to the show, if you like what you're hearing, make sure to jump over and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. That way you'll automatically get the newest episodes when they go live. 
And thank you to those of you who have already left a rating and review. By subscribing, rating, and reviewing, you help to increase the visibility of Gift Biz Unwrapped. It's a great way to pay it forward to help others with their entrepreneurial journey as well.